Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 19D, which is hematology, hemostasis, and thrombosis. We are streaming live from North Bengal Medical College and Hospital via Kolkata. We have a very interesting topic, which is thrombocytopenia, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, and reactive thrombocytosis. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Rupsha Dattapal. She is an MBBS Honors Gold Medalist from the famous Patna Medical College. MD Pathology from North Bengal and presently she is an assistant professor in the North Bengal Medical College with areas of interest in cytopathology, histopathology and hematology. Before I ask Dr. Paul to start, let me request all of you to keep your mic muted, your camera off and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request uh, Dr. Shapal ma'am, please share your screen and let us start. Okay, Just sir. press on that arrow. Yes. Uh, press your entire screen, that thing. Yes. Sir. And once that black screen comes, press in the center and press share. Great. Your screen is visible. Please just open your PowerPoint from the taskbar. Just double yes. click on that. Yes. Sir. Make it full screen and press that yes. hide. Yes. Ma'am, you are good to go. Please start. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Today's topic of my discussion is thrombocytopenia, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and reactive thrombocytosis. As this topic is quite elaborate, I will be concentrating more on the important aspects. So, as you all know, bleeding may be due to either any local cause or due to some bleeding disorder. The bleeding disorders in turn may be due to abnormality of the blood vessels the platelet disorders again which may be either qualitative disorders or quantitative disorders of the platelet and third are the coagulation disorders just giving a brief history platelets were first described by addison in 1841 as extremely minute granules in clotting blood but the term platelet was coined by bizazero these same elements were identified in the peripheral blood smear by Osler and Schaeffer and by him in the late 19th century. As you all know, platelets are small 2 to 4 micron disc shaped anucleated cell fragments which are produced from the megakaryocytes and they have a critical role in the normal primary hemostatic mechanism of the body. As you all know, hemostasis is the mechanism by which the loss of the blood from the vascular system is controlled after vascular injury by a complex interaction of the vessel wall, the platelets and the plasma proteins. Following the vessel injury, hemostasis occurs in two, two stages that is primary and secondary. The primary hemostasis is the initial stage during which the vascular wall and the platelets interact to limit the amount of blood loss from the damaged vessels. Why? During the stage of secondary hemostasis, a stable fibrin clot is formed via the activation of the coagulation casket. Although formation of blood clot is necessary to arrest bleeding, but ultimately this blood clot has to be dissolved so as to resume the normal blood flow. This process of dissolution of blood clot is known as fibrinolysis. Now coming to the role of platelets in the primary hemostasis after vascular injury, Platelets have three important roles. They are first, platelet adhesion. Second, the release reaction of the platelet granules. And third is the platelet aggregation where fibrinogen acts as the bridge. This is a diagram showing the role of platelets in normal hemostasis. Once the vessel wall is injured and the subendothelial connective tissue is exposed, the platelets adhere to this subendothelial collagen. The Addition is nothing but the binding of the platelets to the subendothelial collagen via the GP1B receptors. The von Willebrand factor helps for the addition of these platelets. The congenital absence of GP1B that is known as the Bernard Solia syndrome or congenital absence of the von Willebrand factor in plasma that is known as the von Willebrand disease causes defective platelet addition and bleeding disorder. 
platelets normally circulate as round to oval disc like structures in the circulation with activation the platelets undergo shape change which is due to reorganization of the microtubules and contraction of the actomycin of the microfilaments immediately after addition and shape change release reaction that is secretion of the platelet granules occur adp is released from the dense granules this promotes platelet aggregation the platelet factor 4 is released from the alpha granules which neutralizes the anticoagulant activity of heparin while the platelet derived growth factor stimulates smooth muscle and skin fibroblast proliferation thereby promoting wound healing activated platelets also secrete thromboxin a2 which induces platelet aggregation and local vasoconstriction after that platelet aggregation takes place platelet aggregation is nothing but the binding of the platelets to each other the adp which is released from the platelets causes inhibition of adenyl cyclase and reduction in the level of the cyclic anp a configurational change in the membrane occurs so that the gp2b 3a receptors become exposed on the surface binding of the fibrinogen molecules to the gp2b 3a receptors on adjacent platelets cause platelet aggregation the activated platelets release adp and thromboxin a2 and so a self sustaining reaction is generated leading to the formation of the platelet plug thrombin which is generated from the activation of the coagulation pathway is a potent platelet aggregating agent and it also converts fibrinogen to fibrin thus fibrin together with the aggregated mass of platelets at the site of injury forms a hemostatic plug now coming to the topic proper thrombocytopenia as you all know may be defined as a subnormal number of platelets in the circulating blood the normal platelet count varies from 150000 to 4 lakh per cubic millimeter and so we can define thrombocytopenia as a condition where the platelet count falls below 1 lakh 50000 it is the most common cause of abnormal bleeding although the normal platelet count in humans far exceeds the minimal level required to avoid pathological hemorrhage if the platelet count falls below 50000 there is a chance of surgical bleeding and if the platelet count falls below the critical level of 20000 per cubic millimeter then there is a risk of spontaneous bleeding one should be cautious of a dramatic decline in platelet count even if the count remains within the normal range half life of the platelets is about 10 days and one third of the platelets are sequestered in the spleen normally but in times of increased demand the platelet production can rise manifold now coming to the causes of thrombocytopenia thrombocytopenia can be broadly de- de- classified depending upon the underlying mechanism it may be either artifactual thrombocytopenia can occur as a result of decreased platelet production or increased platelet destruction there may be abnormal platelet distribution or pooling which is known as distributional thrombocytopenia last but not the least is dilutional thrombocytopenia which occurs after massive blood transfusion the most com- com- uh, common mechanisms of thrombocytopenia are impaired platelet production and increased destruction this is a diagram showing the pathogenesis of thrombocytopenia as you can see bone marrow hypoplasia or disordered regulation of thrombopoiesis or inept inact ineffective thrombopoiesis may lead to decreased platelet production again if there is splenomegaly and hypersplenism there is abnormal pooling of the platelets leading to distributional thrombocytopenia again if there is platelet destruction in the periphery it may lead to thrombocytopenia which may be due to either due to th- uh, immune causes or due to non immune causes so artifactual thrombocytopenia may be due to platelet clumping which is caused by anticoagulant dependent immunoglobulins that is known as serothrombocytopenia which is most commonly seen after edta platelet satellitism giant platelets decreased platelet production may again be due to hereditary causes or due to acquired causes there are many hereditary causes 
and today i will not be focusing on the hereditary causes as hereditary causes in itself is a uh, very elaborate topic some of the causes may be myh9 related thrombocytopenia syndromes viscot albrecht syndrome fankini anemia coming to the acquired causes aplastic anemia bone marrow infiltration megaloblastic anemia drugs radiation viral infections may cause thrombocytopenia due to decreased platelet production increased destruction of platelets may be due to immune and due to non immune causes under the immune causes we have autoimmune and alloimmune in the autoimmune we have idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura secondary causes under the alloimmune we have neonatal thrombocytopenia and post transfusion purpura the non immune causes include disseminate in disseminated intravascular coagulation thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura hemolytic uremic syndrome and presence of giant hemangiomas abnormal platelet distribution on pooling in case of splenomegaly and hypersplenism may lead to distributional thrombocytopenia and dilational thrombocytopenia occurs after massive blood transfusion now coming to the clinical features of thrombocytopenia most conditions of thrombocytopenia are associated with bleeding but there are conditions which are associated with thrombotic complications like thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura dic and heparin induced thrombocytopenia in case of thrombocytopenia the site of bleeding is generally superficial and they manifest as petechiae ecchymosis gingival bleeding and epistaxis there may be uh, chances of menorrhagia gastrointestinal bleeding severe complications like intracranial bleeding may also occur but in coagulation factor manifestations um, coagulation factor def uh, deficiencies the bleeding into the joints and soft tissue occur coming to the approach to a thrombocytopenic patient so a thrombocytopenic patient presents with purpuric spots ecchymosis mucous membrane bleeding etc and there are a wide range of differentials so the diagnostic approach should be systematic which is composed of thorough history taking and clinical examination this is followed by laboratory investigations which include certain screening test followed by certain specific tests which depend upon the result of the screening tests and these help to come at a definitive diagnosis so to ascertain the cause of thrombocytopenia we should take a proper history and complete clinical examination is done where we see for the nature of the bleeding the site of bleeding if there is any previous history of bleeding family history any history of drug intake or alcohol intake whether there is any underlying disorder and under clinical examination is very important to note the spleen whether it is palpable or not coming to the labor laboratory investigations peripheral blood smear examination is the most important which is followed by bone marrow examination in certain cases and the coagulation profile so the salient features of diagnosis of thrombocytopenia are first the type of bleeding is superficial the platelet count is low which is confirmed by the low platelet count in the peripheral blood smear coagulation profile the bleeding time is increased the clotting time the prothrombin time and aptt are generally normal and the subsequent laboratory in evaluation is detected by the findings of the screening tests this is the algorithm showing a case of thrombocytopenia and the differentials and what we should do first whenever we get get a case of thrombocytopenia we have to go for ex examination of the peripheral blood smear where we can differentiate between two thrombocytopenia and artifactual thrombocytopenia if there is platelet clumping we can think the plate thrombocytopenia is due to artifactual cause two uh, then we see whether the two thrombocytopenia is isolated or it is associated with certain disorders of the rbcs or the wbcs if there is presence of giant platelets with or without wbc inclusions we can think of hereditary thrombocytopenia again if the thrombocytopenia is associated with presence of cystocytes in the peripheral blood smear we can think of ttp hus syndrome and dic 
then we will go for further investigations like LDH, bilirubin, haptoglobin, PT, APTT, D dimers, FDP, etc. If there is presence of blast, nucleated RBCs, pelgahio, abnormalities of the neutrophils, dacrocytes, etc., then we will think probably it is due to a primary bone marrow disorder and then we can go for bone marrow examination. Again, if there is presence of microspherocytes or there is presence of RBC clumping or agglutination, we can consider Evans syndrome and then we can go for the direct agglutination test, reticulocyte count, LDH, bilirubin, etc. Now, if thrombocytopenia is associated with lymphocytes with presence of reactive lymphocytes or neutrophilia with presence of toxic granulation, we will consider infective causes and then we will go for inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP, viral markers, blood culture, etc. Again, if there is isolated thrombocytopenia, we can think of a number of causes like ITP, drug-induced thrombocytopenia, H. pylori or HCV or HIV-associated uh, thrombocytopenia, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or disseminate intravascular coagulation. Now coming to artifactual thrombocytopenia. Artifactually low platelet count may be due to in vitro clumping of the platelets. The platelet counts are reduced on automated cell counters because they cannot differentiate platelet clumps from individual cells. The overall incidence in hospitalized adult patients is approximately 1%. This may be either due to antibody mediated agglutination as seen in case of EDTA dependent agglutination and platelet satellite satellitism or due to aggregation secondary to platelet activation resulting from improper blood sampling techniques or delayed mixing with the anticoagulants. Artifactual thrombocytopenia is always confirmed by peripheral blood smear examination which shows platelet clumps and we should go for a repeat blood te uh, count test with other anticoagulants like citrate or heparin which will reveal normal platelet count. Coming to EDTA induced thrombocytopenia, EDTA dependent agglutinins are present in about 0.1% of the normal population and the platelet clumping results from the presence of the naturally occurring EDTA dependent antiplatelet antibody which are mainly of the IgG type. EDTA alters the conformation of the GP2B3A complex and exposes new antigens. The, this EDTA dependent antibodies then react with this cryptic antigen and causes platelet clumping and this platelet clumping only occurs in vitro. This is the peripheral blood smear examination picture showing the platelets, clumping of the platelets. Now coming to platelet satellitism, antibodies directed against GP2B3A react simultaneously with the FC receptor 3 of the leukocytes, especially of the neutrophils and monocytes and the platelets form a rosette around this neutrophils and the monocytes. Now coming to aplastic anemia. As you all know, aplastic anemia is characterized by pancytopenia that results from failure of the marrow hematopoiesis. However, some patients with myelodysplastic syndrome or amegakaryocytic thrombocytopenia may present with low platelet count and then progress to pancytopenia and aplastic anemia. So we can see that aplastic anemia may be a cause of thrombocytopenia or the thrombocytopenia may progress to pancytopenia and aplastic anemia. Some data support the hypothesis that aplastic anemia results from an autoimmune attack directed against the hematopoietic stem cells. And the diagnosis can be confirmed with the help of bone marrow examination, that is we go for bone marrow trifine biopsy. Nutritional deficiency also can cause thrombocytopenia, especially when it is associated with vitamin B12 deficiency, when the latter results from autoantibodies which are directed against the parietal cells or the intrinsic factor, and this is associated with immune thrombocytopenia. Various other autoimmune disorders may coexist with this type of immune thrombocytopenia. Now coming to an important topic, that is immune thrombocytopenia, which was previously referred to as idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Immune thrombocytopenia occurs when platelets undergo premature destruction as a result of autoantibody or immune complex deposition on their membranes. 
We must remember that it is a diagnosis of exclusion. It may be primary or secondary and it is characterized by peripheral thrombocytopenia with a normal or increased number of megakaryocytes and absence of splenomegaly. Patients have no identifiable underlying cause like infections, collagen vascular disease, drugs, etc. They are diagnosed to be suffering from primary ITP. Now, primary ITP, immune thrombocytopenia, can be of two types, that is acute and chronic. Acute ITP is defined when thrombocytopenia lasts for less than six months and usually resolves spontaneously. This most commonly affects children in the age group of two to six years and young adults. And the peak incidence is in the winter and spring, which follows the incidence of viral infection. And here there is no sex preponderance. In acute ITP, antiviral antibodies cross-react with the platelet antigens or the immune complexes of viral antigens and host antiviral antibodies bind to the FC receptors on the platelets and thus cause immune destruction of the platelets. On the other hand, chronic ITP lasts for more than six months and most commonly occurs in adult females and this is not preceded by any infection or underlying disease. And chronic ITP generally occurs more commonly in females. The female to male ratio is 3 to 1. The spleen is not palpable and in the presence of splenomegaly, an alternative diagnosis should be considered. Some patients have asymptomatic thrombocytopenia and are discovered incidentally during routine blood counts. And chronic ITP is an indolent disease with remissions and recurrences. Now coming to the pathogenesis of chronic ITP. Chronic ITP is caused by autoantibodies, which are especially of the IgG type directed against the GP2B3A receptor or the GP1B9 receptor, which bind to the platelets and are subsequently removed by the mononuclear phagocytic system via the macrophage FC gamma receptors. And this destruction generally occurs in the spleen and the liver. These antibodies are also directed against the megakaryocytes. As the antibodies block the GP2B3A, they, in addition to causing platelet destruction, also cause platelet dysfunction. A compensatory increase in platelet production occurs in some patients in response to the antibody-mediated platelet destruction, while in others, the platelet production is impaired due to intramedullary destruction of the antibody-coated platelets or by inhibition of megakaryopoiesis. Thrombocytopenia mainly occurs due to the shortening of the platelet survival. The spleen plays a crucial role. First, the antiplatelet antibodies are produced in the spleen and the destruction of the sensitized platelets mainly occur in the spleen. This is a chart showing the differences between acute ITP and chronic ITP, which already I discussed. Uh, here, the, the spontaneous remission generally occurs in acute ITP in 80% of cases, whereas in chronic ITP, spontaneous remission is uncommon. And the platelet count in acute ITP is below 20,000 per microliters, whereas in chronic ITP, it varies from 30 to 80,000 per cubic millimeter. Spontaneous bleeding into the skin in the form of PTK is characteristic. Hemorrhagic manifestations are of the purpuric type and the severity and frequency of the hemorrhagic ma manifestations correlate with the platelet count. Intracranial hemorrhage, although rare, is the most serious complication of ITP. Excessive bleeding often follows after tooth extractions and tonsillectomy and this may be the first suggestion that the person is suffering from ITP. Blood loss often lead to anemia. Platelets are often markedly reduced and macrothrombocytes are found. Megakaryocytes are normal or increased in the bone marrow and they often show morphological changes like hypogranularity of the cytoplasm, vacuolization and dense nuclear chromatin. In If the clinical features CBC and blood smear examination are indicative of ITP, in that case we don't need a bone marrow examination. That means bone marrow examination is not mandatory to diagnose a case of ITP. Antiplatelet antibodies are raised 
but as they are not specific we generally do not go for the detection of the antiplatelet antibodies and they also require reference labs for the detection coming to the treatment of itp treatment is directed against the reduction of the level and source of autoantibody and the reduction of the rate of destruction of the sensitized platelets acute itp is a self limited disorder and management is generally supportive but in case of severe bleeding oral steroids or iv immunoglobulins can be given in life threatening bleeding platelet transfusion along with high dose iv steroids or iv immunoglobulins are given in case of asymptomatic chronic itp no treatment is required but in symptomatic patients where the platelet count falls below 30000 per cubic millimeter the initial treatment is with corticosteroids iv immunoglobulins globulins may be tried in patients unresponsive to steroids indications for splenectomy are failure to respond to steroids relapse and high dose of steroids are needed to maintain remission then certain drugs like atherpin and cyclophosphamide are tried if there is severe dyspnea even the steroid therapy and splenectomy now coming to drug induced thrombocytopenia development of thrombocytopenia after quinine was first described by wippen in 1865 and since then a large number of drugs have been implicated in the causation of thrombocytopenia drug induced thrombocytopenia affects only a small small percentage of patients who take a particular drug and genetic and environmental factors have a role to play drugs cause thrombocytopenia by different mechanisms of which direct toxicity dose dependent myelosuppression and immune destruction of the platelets are important mechanisms it should be suspected when patient has recurrent episodes of thrombocytopenia with prompt recovery generally drug induced thrombocytopenia develops within 1 to 2 weeks after daily drug exposure but the but the thrombocytopenia may develop within hours of drug exposure if the patient has already been exposed to the same drug results within 5 to 7 days of drug discontinuation drugs which cause thrombocytopenia are many of which quinine quinidine heparin gold salts apixaban are important treatment includes discontinuation of the drug platelet transfusion and administration of iv immunoglobulins may be helpful in certain cases now coming to an important topic that is heparin induced thrombocytopenia it is an important topic in the present scenario because heparin is widely used as an anticoagulant for the treatment of treatment and prevention of thromboembolic disorders although bleeding is the most common adverse uh, adverse reaction associated with heparin heparin induced thrombocytopenia which is also known as the white clot syndrome is a potentially severe although paradoxical immune mediated complication of heparin therapy which is associated with thrombosis heparin induced thrombocytopenia differs from other causes of drug induced thrombocytopenia in two ways in heparin induced thrombocytopenia the thrombocytopenia is not usually severe that is counts rarely fall below 20000 and hit is not associated with bleeding rather it markedly raises the risk of thrombotic complications heparin induced thrombocytopenia is a life threatening disorder which may occur after exposure to the various forms of heparin heparin induced thrombocytopenia occurs approximately in 3 to 5% of patients during or after unfractionated unfractionated heparin therapy for 5 days or more while the incidence is about less than 1% during low molecular weight heparin therapy heparin induced thrombocytopenia is characterized by a decrease in platelet count of more than 50% from the highest platelet count value after the start of heparin developing typically between 5 to 14 days after the commencement of heparin therapy it is characterized by hypercoagulability and the presence of heparin dependent platelet activating igg type of antibodies a platelet count fall before 5 days of heparin therapy is unlikely to represent hit except in those patients who have had a recent history of heparin within the preceding 3 months delayed onset hit is a clinical challenge as patients may develop thrombocytopenia with or without thrombosis days to weeks after heparin cessation heparin induced thrombocytopenia more commonly affects surgical patients 
and is more common in females. There are two types of it, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the non-immunological type, whereas the type 2 is an immune-mediated disorder. Type 1 hit occurs within the first 2-3 days of heparin therapy and the platelet count normalizes after the discontinuation of heparin therapy. It is a non-immune disorder and results from the direct effect of heparin on platelet activation and it is known as heparin-associated thrombocytopenia. While type 2 hit is an immune mediated disorder that typically occurs 5 to 14 days after heparin exposure and often has life and limb threat threatening thrombotic complications. In general medical practice, HIT actually refers to the type 2 HIT and from here on we will uh, 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 classify type 2 HIT as HIT. This is the uh, chart showing the differences between the immune and the non-immune type of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. In type 1 HIT, the severity of thrombocytopenia is mild where the, where the platelet count usually remains above 1 lakh whereas in type 2 HIT, that is an immune mediated HIT, the generally the severity of thrombocytopenia the, uh, is severe to moderate where the mean platelet count is about 60,000. The thrombotic complications are common in type 2 hit. Management is observation in case of type 1 hit whereas in type 2 hit we have to discontinue heparin and we have to start with an alternative anticoagulant. Mainly the direct thrombin inhibitors are started. Outcome is self-limited in case of type 1 hit whereas in type 2 hit several thrombotic complications and even death may occur. Coming to the pathogenesis of HIT, that is type 2 HIT, platelet activation in vivo results in release of platelet factor 4. This platelet factor 4 is actually a tetrameric platelet alpha granule constituent which is liberated into the blood where it also binds to the exterior of the platelet surface. Heparin being a polyanion can bind to these positively charged PF4 tetramers resulting in the formation of heparin platelet factor 4 complex which is immunogenic under certain circumstances. HIT results from the binding of these antibodies of antibodies that is of the IgG type to the heparin PF4 complex which, which form immune complex that triggers the cross-linking of the platelet FC gamma 2A receptor that leads to platelet activation and formation of thrombogenic microparticles. The end result is development of thrombocytopenia in the setting of a profound hypercoagulable state. This is the pathophysiology behind HIT where we can see on activation of the platelets, the platelet factor 4 are liberated in the blood and they come to the exterior of the platelet. The heparin combines with this platelet factor 4 to form the uh, immune complexes which combine with the IgG type of the antibodies, IgG type of immunoglobulins forming immune complexes which cross link with the, the play, uh, through the FC receptors causing platelet activation. These sensitized platelets are removed by the splenic macrophages causing thrombocytopenia on the one hand. Then the, the platelet activation causes platelet release reaction, platelet aggregation and thrombosis. And these platelet activation also releases procoagulant microparticles which also helps in increasing the thrombotic complications. Coming to the complications of it, heparin induced thrombocytopenia associated thrombocytosis, uh, thrombosis is the most feared complication. About 50% of patients with HIT have been noted to develop life or limb threatening thrombosis. The thrombotic tendency generally lasts for at least 30 days. Thrombosis can develop even after the discontinuation of heparin and platelet count recovery. Venous thrombosis is more common than arterial thrombosis and extremity deep vein thrombosis is most frequent followed by pulmonary embolism and cerebral sinus thrombosis. Arterial thrombosis generally affects the extremities although stroke, myocardial infarction and renal art artery thrombosis may also occur. Patients who have pre-existing vascular lesions or presence of intravascular catheters, sepsis or post-operative venous stasis are more susceptible to develop hit associated thrombotic complications.
other clinical manifestations include some skin lesions adrenal vein thrombosis which lead to hemorrhagic infarction this heparin induced skin lesions occur in response to subcutaneous unfractionate heparin injections and the skin lesions develop at the site of heparin injection and can they and they can range from painful red plaques to overt skin necrosis acute systemic that is anaphylactoid reactions may occur following iv heparin bolus these are the clinical manifestations of heparin like deep vein thrombosis venous gangrene skin necrosis etc now coming to the diagnosis of hit hit is primarily a clinical diagnosis hit should be strongly suspected in any patient who develops thrombocytopenia while receiving heparin therapy diagnosis should be strongly considered in any patient in whom the platelet count falls below 50% of the baseline value after the fifth day of heparin therapy a 30% fall in baseline platelet count combined with any form of thrombosis in a patient receiving heparin should be considered due to hit unless proved otherwise limitations of the laboratory assays for hit has led to the development of a clinical scoring system which, which is known as a 4t scoring system so as to determine the pre test probability of hit this is the 4t prediction for diagnosis of hit thrombocytopenia the timing of the platelet count fall thrombosis or uh, presence of thrombosis or other sequelae and other causes of thrombocytopenia if present the scoring is from 0 to 8 and if the score is below 3 when uh, 3 or below 3 there is a low probability of it if there is the score is 4 to 5 there is an intermediate probability of it and if the score is more than 6 that is 6 to 8 there is a high chance of developing hit the scoring system this 40 scoring system has a high negative predictive value so a low pre test score may be useful in ruling out the diagnosis of hit coming to the laboratory testing for hit as hit is a clinical pathological diagnosis it requires a combined evaluation of clinical examination and laboratory test results use of the clinical scoring system that is the 4t scoring system is recommended to establish the need for further diagnostic laboratory testing in hit because of the limitations of the laboratory assays for hit monitoring of the platelet count and a high index of clinical suspicion are essential whenever heparin is administered currently available in vitro diagnosis diagnostic tests for hit are the immunoassays and the functional assays if the 4t score is elevated the next step is screening with the immunological assay this immunological assays also have a high negative predictive value so when it is positive it should be followed by functional assays for confirmation but if the immunological assays are negative then this is not followed by functional assays and we can rule out the diagnosis of it this is the algorithm when we clinically suspect hit we first go for the 4t scoring system the 4t scoring system if the score is low that is 0 to 3 then lab test is not necessary if alternate diagnosis is present if alternate diagnosis is uncertain then we have to perform immunoassay if the immunoassay shows negative result we can rule out hit but if it shows a positive result then we have to consider functional assay in the form of serotonin release assay for the definitive diagnosis if there is an intermediate score of 4 to 5 we have to perform immunoassay and while we are waiting for the result we stop heparin and initiate an alternate anticoagulant in the form of the direct thrombin inhibitors if the if the immunoassay shows negative result hit is unlikely if immunoassay shows positive re result hit is probably is probable and if it is more than 1 od units it is most probable to have hit then we consider serotonin release assay for the definitive diagnosis if the score is high that means there is high chance of hit in that case we perform immunoassay 
while we await the immunoassay results, we stop heparin, initiate alternate, initiate alternate anticoagulants in the form of direct thrombin inhibitors. If the result is negative, it is unlikely. And if we have a positive result on immunoassay, it is diagnosed and we don't have to go for the functional assay when the 4T score is high. Coming to the immunological assays, the immunoassays detect the presence of heparin PA4 antibody using the ELISA technique. Hit ELISAs have high sensitivity but poor specificity for diagnosis and therefore it is helpful to exclude a diagnosis of HIT in conjunction with pretest probability. Most of the immunoassays detect the IgG, IgM and IgA antibodies but only the IgG antibodies are pathognomonic. ELISA IgG have also been developed nowadays and IgG testing has are done in certain reference labs. So ELISA IgG testing has a high negative predictive value and so HIT is unlikely in patients with a negative antibody test. The reliability of an immunoglobulin ELISA in diagnosing HIT can be improved by considering the positivity of the result that is if the higher optical density values in an ELISA are associated with the increased likelihood of positive functional assay results and clinical HIT. As not all patients with a positive ELISA will have HIT, functional assays are useful for further evaluation. Functional assays actually detect the platelet aggregation or the platelet activation after exposure to suspected HIT serum and heparin. There are a number of functional assays of which heparin induced platelet activation, the serotonin release assays are important. The carbon-14 serotonin release assay is considered the gold standard for HIT diagnostic confirmation. The serotonin release assay actually employs washed donor platelets which detects and detects their activation by measuring the release of endogenous serotonin that is induced by addition of patient serum in the presence of heparin. Coming to the management of HIT, the goal is to reduce the thrombotic risk of thrombotic complications by reducing platelet activation and thrombin generation. So we have to discontinue all forms of HIT and we have to initiate an alternate anticoagulant. Coming to the treatment of HIT, the initial treatment is to discontinue the heparin exposure. Even the heparin coated catheters have to be removed. Initiation of alternative anticoagulants is done. Usually, the direct thrombin inhibitors like argetropan, lepirudin, or valerin are used. Direct thrombin inhibitors are used as monotherapy until the collection of platelet count at which time the bridging therapy with warfarin is started. Warfarin should never be used as a sole alternative anticoagulant in HIT. The role of warfarin in the treatment of HIT has long been disputed. This is because of its relatively slow onset of action, multiple drug interactions, and as it is associated with the unusual syndrome of venous limb gangrene, as well as skin necrosis. After both the normalization of the platelet count and subsequent initiation of warfarin, both warfarin and the direct thrombin inhibitors are continued for at least five days. When HIT is not associated with thrombosis, then warfarin therapy is continued for a period of four weeks. And if HIT is associated with thrombosis, then warfarin therapy for a period of 12 weeks is recommended. Because of the complexity of diagnosis and treatment of HIT, HIT prevention should be emphasized. Patients receiving unfractionated heparin should have platelet count monitoring at baseline and at least every third day between the day 5 and day 14 of heparin exposure. Heparin re-exposure should be averted in patients with history of HIT. Low molecular weight heparin or Fonda Parinox that is factor 10 a inhibitor may be preferable to unfractionated heparin for both treatment and prevention of thromboembolic diseases. Now coming to alloimmune cause of thrombocytopenia that is neonatal thrombocytopenia. When the fetal platelets, uh, when the fetal platelets possessing paternally derived antigens lacking in the mother enter the maternal circulation during gestation or delivery, 
formation of allo antibodies is stimulated these maternal antibodies are of the immunoglobulin g type and they cross the placenta and cause destruction of the fetal platelets the most common antigen against which antibodies are formed is hpa1 alpha the condition is self limited usually resolves by 3 weeks after delivery in severe cases purpura and hemorrhages are evident at birth or they may manifest within a few hours severe symptomatic thrombocytopenia is treated by platelet transfusion which is obtained from the mother Aluminium neonatal thrombocytopenia should be distinguished from other causes of neonatal thrombocytopenia like other congenital causes like Fanconi anemia, Viscot Aldridge, Berner's Soria, etc., or congenital non-inherited thrombocytopenia caused by drugs, infections, or congenital leukemia. Coming to post-transfusion purpura, it is a rare but serious complication of a blood component transfusion. in which severe thrombocytopenia occurs 5 to 10 days after transfusion it has a sudden onset and bleeding may be severe most commonly affect females it typically occurs after rbc transfusion although it can occur after any blood component transfusion the transfusion recipient has antibodies against the human platelet specific antigens acquired through prior transfusion transplant or pregnancy anti hpa antibody destroys the autologous platelets Detection of the HPA antibodies can be performed in reference labs. The main stage stay of treatment is IV immunoglobulins. Other modalities include glucocorticoids and therapeutic plasma exchange. Pla platelet transfusion is not helpful in the acute phase. Now coming to disseminated intravascular coagulation. It is a consumptive coagulopathy which occurs second as a secondary complication to a variety of disease. it is characterized by activation of the intravascular coagulation with microvascular thrombi formation thrombocytopenia depletion of the clotting factors variable bleeding complications and end organ damage it is of two types acute and chronic treatment is to address the underlying cause administration of coagulation factors and platelets are done and heparin and protein c are administered for anticoagulation this is the pathophysiology of dic we where we can see sepsis massive tissue destruction endothelial injury all cause tissue factor release of tissue factor endothelial injury will cause platelet aggregation release of tissue factor together with platelet aggregation will form widespread microvascular thrombosis which will cause vascular occlusion and may lead to microangiopathic hemolytic anemia this vascular occlusion may cause ischemic tissue damage then widespread as microvascular thrombosis causes activation of plasmin fibrinolysis occur and the proteolysis of the clotting factors take place which leads to bleeding because of the consumption of the clotting factors and platelets as well as because of the proteolysis of the clotting factors bleeding occur coming to acute dic it is commonly seen in severe sepsis septic shock in cases of obstetric complications like abrupt shock placenta preeclampsia after abo incompatible blood transfusion and as a complication of apml that is acute promyelocytic leukemia it is a consumptive coagulopathy in this case is severe and it leads to bleeding manifestations and frequent organ damage the lab findings include low platelet or falling platelet counts on repeat testing prolonged pt and aptt low fibrinogen and or falling levels on repeat testing low levels of coagulation inhibitors increased levels of fdp and d dimers on peripheral blood smear examination there will be presence of cystocytes coming to chronic dic in chronic dic there is a slow activation of coagulation in small amounts with slow consumption of the coagulation factors so the clotting factors are normal clinical features are minimum and lab abnormalities are the only evidence of dic it may occur in intrauterine death liver disease giant hemangiomas malignancy etc chronic dic is a protracted disease which usually manifest as venous thrombosis the lab findings show the platelet count to be normal or slightly decreased unlike acute dic in chronic dic the pt and aptt are normal but the fdp is that is fibrin degradation product is raised now coming to thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura this is associated with thrombotic complications 
It is a rare disorder which is characterized by the formation of highly microthrombi in the microcirculation of various organs due to the aggregation of platelets. Generally affects young female adults. It is characterized by a pentad of manifestations in the form of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, bleeding manifestations secondary to severe thrombocytopenia, fluctuating neurological dysfunctions, renal abnormalities and fever. But all these five manifestations may not be present in all the patients. But the first two, that is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and bleeding manifestations secondary to severe thrombocytopenia are the important manifestations which should be present in a case of TTP. Coming to the pathogenesis, TTP is, is associated with a deficiency of ADMTS13, which is known as the von Willebrand factor metalloprotease, which normally degrades the ultra large multimers of von Willebrand factor. In the absence of ADMTS13, the multimers of the von Willebrand factor accumulate in the plasma and cause platelet activation, aggregation, and thrombus formation. This Deficiency of Adam TS, that is absence or deficiency, may be inherited due to inactivating mutations or may be acquired. It can be induced by drugs like ticlopidine, quinine, tacrolimus, and the increased, there is an increased incidence with pregnancy or HIV infection. In normal su subjects, the Adam TS 13 causes lysis of these large multiples of one vilibrant factor, but in case of a patient with TTP, this Adam TS, there is deficiency of the Adam TS 13 and cleavage, cleavage of these um, large multimers of one vilibrant factor does not occur, which will cause adhesion and aggregation of the platelets and thereby causing thrombotic disorders, formation of microthrombi and thrombotic disorders. Coming to the lab findings of TTP, hemoglobin is moderately depressed, platelet count ranges from 20,000 to 50,000. PBF will show presence of cystocytes. Cystocytes in the form of helmet cells are often present. Occasionally, nucleated RBCs may be present. LDH and bilirubin levels are elevated. PT and APTT are normal. The treatment, the mainstay of treatment over here is plasma exchange. But if plasma exchange is delayed, fresh frozen plasma can be given. The inciting agent should be removed. But routine platelet transfusions are contraindicated. But in case of life-threatening hemorrhage, platelet transfusion can be considered. Splenectomy, antiplatelet drugs, steroids, vincristine can be tried in unresponsive cases. Coming to hemolytic, hemolytic uremic syndrome, it usually is classified along with TTP as TTP-HUS. It has more renal manifestations and fewer neurological sequelae than th thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and it is characterized by a triad of acute renal failure, thrombocytopenia, and microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. It predominantly occurs in infants and children and follows a diarrheal disease, which is caused by either E. coli or Shigella. Formation of thrombi is limited to the renal microcirculation, unlike in TTP, where it can affect any circulation. Now coming to distributional thrombocytopenia. As you all know, about one third of the circulating platelets are normally sequestered in the spleen. But in cases of splenomegaly and hypersplenism, about 90% of uh, um, uh, uh, platelets may be sequestered in the spleen. And this may be associated with leukopenia and or anemia. Although the circulating platelet count decreases, but the total platelet mass and overall platelet survival remain normal. Hence, these patients can have significant apparent thrombocytopenia, but they rarely manifest as clinical bleeding. They rarely present as clinical bleeding. Coming to dilutional thrombocytopenia, dilutional thrombocytopenia can occur when large quantities of packed RBCs are transfused to treat massive hemorrhage due to absence of viable platelets in the packed RBCs. This can be prevented by giving platelet concentrates to platelets receiving more than 20 units of packed RBCs in a 24-hour period. Now coming to the last topic of our discussion today, reactive thrombocytosis. As you all know, thrombocytosis refers to the increase in the platelet count above normal, that is above 4 lakh per cubic millimeter. It may be either primary or secondary. Secondary 
uh, thrombocytopenia is known as reactive thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytosis is most commonly reactive and it is secondary to increased levels of circulating cytokines that stimulate thrombopoiesis. It may be due to inflammatory, vasculitic, allergic disorders, may be due to acute and chronic infections, malignancies, hemolysis, iron deficiency and blood loss can lead to reactive thrombocytosis. Generally, in reactive thrombocytosis, platelet count is modestly elevated and as such, there is no significant clinical manifestation. Evidence of ongoing inflammation may be present, which can be seen by raised CRP, raised ESR, etc. Persistent thrombocytosis following splenectomy for chronic hemolytic anemia may result in increased risk of thromboembolic complications if hemolysis is not completely corrected. These are the causes of reactive thrombocytosis as I already discussed. Now coming to the take home message, thrombocytopenia may be defined as a subnormal number of platelets in the circulating blood. Platelet has important role in the primary hemostatic mechanism. The causes of thrombocytopenia may be due to decreased production, increased destruction of platelets, distributional, dilutional or artifactual. Hit is an important cause of life or limb threatening thrombosis. Thrombocytosis refers to the increase in the platelet count above normal that is 4 lakh per cubic millimeter and this may be primary or secondary that is reactive. These are my references. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank very you so nicely much. done. Very nicely. Very clear in your concept and your speech. Very clearly deliberated. Excellent presentation, Dr. Rupsha. Very well. Thank you, sir. Thank Brilliant. you, sir. Brilliant. Content is so good, and by the content, we can see that you have really done a hard work. Very nice content. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank Great. You, sir. So you have already shared your PPT, so we will sh uh, upload that, making it the PDF. And let me just see if there's any question on the YouTube. Please hold the line. Right. There are no questions. Very excellent presentation, very detailed out and very specific to the point. Everybody will really enjoy reading and learning from that.